We find ourselves this morning with a very interesting little piece of the law in Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 10 and 11, we heard these words. When you make a loan of any kind to your neighbor, do not go into his house to get what he is offering as a pledge. Stay outside and let the man to whom you are making the loan bring the pledge out to you. Some of you are probably very familiar with the fact that Deuteronomy is full of the law. Uh, Moses is, is giving this law. And the, so Deuteronomy is the fifth book in the Bible, and the first four, um, well, we end with numbers right before Deuteronomy, and you feel like you're ready for that conquest, Canaan. Moses brought the people out of slavery. They've been making this very long journey, and they're about to enter the promised land. But we might remember that Moses never gets to go. He gets to see it. He gets to see it from the top of a mountain, but he never gets to go into the promised land. But in this final act in Deuteronomy, uh, we have this kind of pause before that, that story of actually entering into the, the promised land. And he's delivering the law, and he's also making this transfer of power to Joshua. So we have these interesting rules to think about, these interesting laws. And among them, when you make any Make a loan of any kind to your neighbor. Do not go into his house to get what he is offering as a pledge. Now in my notes, in my Bible, right before Deuteronomy starts, the, book, the notes of it, it says that the love relationship of the Lord to his people and that of the people to the Lord pervades the whole book. So how we love God and how God loves us is found throughout Deuteronomy. And we could say, of course, the whole Bible. But if we think about that, what does that say to us about our law? About if you make a loan of any kind to your neighbor, do not go into his house. What does that say to us about how to treat one another? Or how to express that love? Does everyone know what a pledge is in that context? From what I read, if someone wanted to offer a loan, the person gets to decide whether or not to take it. And if he does decide to take that loan, it was right to offer some security or some, something as, as a form or as like a kind of an assurance that that loan was going to be paid back. So that's that pledge that would be brought back to the person giving the loan. So it's kind of like giving someone space to consider something. And if we think about giving a loan, we find ourselves thinking about money. Now, for those of you who are regular worshipers here, uh, what we found in some of the our messages in the last few weeks is that there, this money keeps popping up. And I didn't mean to do it on purpose at all, but we, this issue of money pops up. And we know we can think about this as a rule of how to deal with money or loaning money. But on a different level, we can think about the fact that we have a different kind of treasure. And that is, it's helpful, so in this, in this way, it's helpful to think about that phrase, a wealth of knowledge. 
So we have a treasure of knowledge, we hope. Wisdom, understanding. So now what do you think we're doing with that? When you are offering something, do not go into their house. Do you see where this can lead us as an idea? Have you ever given, how about this, have you ever given advice or what you thought was a good idea or this nugget of wisdom and shared it with someone and expected them to do something with it? Expected them to follow it? That is a way of thinking about Find the perfect place here. I know there is one. That is the way a way to think about it. That when we are lending something, it can be what we know to be true. It can be our advice. It can be what we think is right about a certain situation. It can be whatever truth we have. And we can offer it, but we can only go so far with what we offer. And if you continue to think about this vision, not about a house, if you think about that phrase, home is where the heart is, it, it adds to that, I, that picture that you can offer someone something, but we have no control, or and shouldn't, I guess, try to control what someone does with it and if they love it or not. We really don't have that uh, responsibility. I was noticing this week, um, I'm sorry to bring my kids into the spotlight, I'm sure they'll appreciate this as they get older, but I was noticing that as often happens with children when they're playing together, they play together really well, and then somewhere they kind of cross that line into somebody's telling the other person what they're going to do. And so the kids were outside, and we have this car they can drive around in the backyard. And one of them was all of a sudden telling the other one, you sit here, and I'm driving. And the other one was not too keen on this idea, and the episode ended with tears. But that's how it... It happens is that even as children, we learn about this. That maybe from the other end, that we, we don't like someone to tell us how to, how to play, or what to do, and how it's going to be. Now, when I was younger, I was thinking about for myself, because my sister was older and I was the youngest, she always got to be the mom Barbie. <laughs> and whenever we played, this is just the way it was. She was the mom Barbie, and there was no other way around it. So I finally aired my grievance. All these years, I've been keeping it to myself. I never got to be the mom, but but that it, you know, there's this feeling that that doesn't feel very welcoming. Yesterday we had a wedding. Um, some of you would know um, Jason Reese was married. Jason helped us, our church out in the garage sale we had a few, uh, several weeks ago. He works with Kurt and Jean and helps them out a lot. And I was able to officiate at his wedding yesterday. And as is, cust or as is often happens, one of the most beautiful passages to read at a wedding comes out of Corinthians chapter 13, and it says about love, the part that I always catches me, is that love does not insist on its own way. Love does not insist on its own way. And what happens in life when we try to force our will on somebody else, or force what we think to be right on somebody else? And the news story that's really caught my attention and, and I've, I'm so saddened about is the story in Bangladesh about this garment factory. Um, there were other shops in this building. There were banks 
um, other kinds of shops, and they noticed a day before, I'm sure some of you, a lot of you have probably seen the pictures, they, were, they noticed a crack in the building. And they told those shops and the banks, the other ones, they said, don't come to work on the next day. But the person running the garment factory said, no, you need to report to work. And it's just that loss of life that is so sad because what was more important was somebody's decision to say, that money, we don't want to lose a day making that versus what was really safe in that building. And in some ways that, I was so sad by that, and in another sense it was hard, you know, I've never been to India, um, or that area of the country, and so in a way it felt very far away. But then I saw another article that brought it into my home, and that is that maybe I'm part of the problem. That my choosing to buy cheap, inexpensive clothing when I don't know where it comes from and I don't know who makes it contributes to to someone being okay with running a poorly uh, built factory and and not having maybe standards because maybe there's not as much transparency as there should be and unfortunately in that area of the country this isn't the first time that, that this kind of thing has happened. Just last November there was a fire and a hundred and some workers perished because they couldn't get out of the building. And they had ties to Walmart and J.C. Penney. Um, so now it's like here is another, here is an occasion where actually maybe a truth is being brought to my home. And what do I do about that now? Do I feel okay going back to Walmart and buying inexpensive clothing or wherever when I don't know where it comes from? And yet nobody can force me. No one can force me to make any kind of decision. It's totally up to me. One of the reasons that this, this passage struck me is because I found it in a in a, a book in my library by Julian Smith. He was a minister years and years ago in the church, and he wrote these wonderful sermons, and one of them was about this passage in Deuteronomy, and he titled it, The Right of Decision. And he said, this is so important to consider, giving somebody the space, not demanding that we make our ideas somebody else's. He says, we see it when we, we see it because it's so important in our relationships with our spouse. It's important with our family, and he says, especially with grown-up children. All of a sudden, moms and dads have to become the dear outsider. And they have to just hope that that pledge is delivered. And he said, it's also true about the church. This is one of our roles as the church, that we have this beautiful message to offer, that we, that we are bringing this message to light, uh, he says, to repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And that we, we are wanting to share about the life of the Lord and how beautiful it is and what a difference it can make. And then... We can't do anything else. That's as much as we can do. We can want to work towards the good. We can help as much as we can. We can offer the truth as we see it. We can share what we have to share. And then, and then that's as far as we can go. Now, I don't know if our church has ever had that problem of of really trying to get in too hard. I wonder sometimes if our church is in a couple of neighborhoods away saying, hey, this is pretty good over here. <laughs> because we do value independence. We do value freedom. When Swedenborg was writing in his theological works, he said, if this doesn't sound true to you when I'm writing, do not take it on as your own. Think about it. See if it makes sense. He also said all religions are like the different um, 
in a the different gems in a crown. So we see that, but it's still so important to to share what we have, and then to realize that everyone has their choice. And what is beautiful about this, as Julian Smith said, is that this is the same law that God follows to. God created each of our hearts. God created each of us with it in a very specific design so that that love and wisdom could flow in us. God created the fact that we feel we have freedom. God gave each of us that. God is the creator of the entire universe. He is with every one of us in every moment. And he is kind to guide us in every moment towards the most loving, right, useful path. And yet God does not say, you have to love me. Isn't that something to think about? That freedom is so important that God would say, I want you to have all of this. And I want to come in and dine with you. And I can provide so much nourishment if you will let me in. But I will not make you. In our relationships with each other, we can remember this. And in our interactions with each other, we can remember the importance of everyone having their hearts to themselves. But, and we can turn that open sign on. We can keep the open sign there and work towards that in ourselves. And may we each work to do this in the coming days of our lives.